Let's keep going here. All right. So if you're looking at a financial statement in the actual filings, right, you're going to have footnotes, which are basically explanations as to what and how, I guess, a specific charge is being recorded. And we, we can look at that in a second. But first of all, um, it's important to establish the fact that marketing is basically the name of the game here, right? So this is primarily um, any filing or earnings report that a company re releases is first and foremost, right, a marketing document, right? They want to market their security to investors. They want to look good um, because that in turn, right, will increase demand for their equity. It will make it easier for them to raise capital and conduct their business. So just be aware of that. Um, don't take everything that companies say at face value. However, at the same time, obviously companies know best, right, what is going on inside their business. Um, now, a company will select the methods that are most relevant and reflective of their unique business industry and economic environment, right? Now, so actually, we recently had a lesson, right, on why we would want to at times look at non-GAAP over GAAP earnings, right? And non-GAAP earnings, right, are a way for a company to say, hey, like, here's our results under the requirements that have been asked from us. But we think that, um, you know, our business is better represented by portraying the results like this. Now, a, a lot of times uh, this makes sense, right? Because there's so many different companies that have really grown out of the framework, really the accounting framework that has been developed. Um, and so a lot of times it makes sense because um, I guess financials really aren't recorded the same way, or there's not a lot of guidance for how financials should be recorded um, outside the scope of that framework. Right. But a lot of times companies take it to another level. And I like, I like uh, quote, uh, talking about WeWork, right? WeWork had a community adjusted EBITDA. I don't even know what that is, but that's not something that really uh, we should be taking at face value, right? A company doesn't actually produce any, um, any earnings, right? And they're able to come up with a definition of earnings that actually says that they do, right? So just keep that in mind. And um, most importantly, right? So companies utilize different accounting methods, right? There's a lot of gray space in terms of reporting, right? Outside of, again, the rules that there are. So if you do want to act, like want to be able to compare companies effectively, um, you do want to know, right? How companies recognize the revenue, right? How companies value the assets um, on their balance sheet, right? How inventory costs are, I guess, calculated for a company, right? So that is absolutely something that you want to look into. All right. So we previously talked about what we're looking for. We're looking for significant changes in red flags, and we want to be able to um, gauge the story, right, of the company. And we want to find the numbers backing that story. Um, and we want to find evidence of competitive advantage that will allow us to stay in that investment for years to come. Now, there's a lot of methods here. Um, we're going to just go down the list here and show you some examples of these. Um, now, let me switch to my browser. So a couple of things. First of all, if you want to find the filings for any company, I actually don't even uh go to Edgar um, because that they have actually updated that website, but I just prefer going to the investor relations of that company. Now, all you have to do is just type in the name of the company and I IR, investor relations. Every single company will have a page like this set up and you're going to see press releases, earnings reports. This is where you can actually find the webcast if you want to listen in to um, earnings calls. 
but they'll have a page called SEC filings and they'll have them all presented to you neatly right here. And you're gonna be able to sort. So what you really care about are the annual filings and the quarterly filings. So Amazon just had their 10K come out and we can just view that as a PDF. So, and here it is, right? And so every single piece of like financial information that you see anywhere, um, like on Yahoo Finance, I don't know, wherever you get your financial data from, right? It all can be found here. So um, I encourage you guys to actually try going through these. I, I will point out, right, this is 80 pages right here. We can actually go to GoPro IR and see their filings. Um, let's see. And while Mark does this, guys, it's so important to be able to go through the SEC filing yourself, finding out where all the information are. They are itemized. And as you can see, you know, they uh, split it up into sections and then there's items. On every SEC filing, this structure is the same. The context is obviously going to change, but that structure is always in place. So it's going to make it easier for you the next following time when you have to look over a ticker, you can know exactly where it is by just looking at this table of content. Right. And uh, so as you can see, like there's a lot, I guess there's a lot of things that, aren't really important, I guess, for you in the interest of time. Um, a lot of people like reading these straight down, right? Um, but, you know, they, they, there's a lot of, I guess, legal um, coverage, right? So you get the business overview, right? They tell you a lot of times, like, what products they have, uh, the risk factors, right? So now management tries to identify all the possible risks that they might think there are. Um, and this is great, right? Because as we previously said, management does know best um, what's going on in their company. But of course, this doesn't mean that this is all the risk there is. And they're, they're definitely gonna want to underplay it, right? They're not gonna be like, we are about to go out of business, <laughs> um, right? So you wanna definitely take this with a grain of salt, but you can uh, read through this, right? and they're going to talk about their various products, the services they, they offer. Um, for me, like it's extremely useful just to uh, be able to go through this. Now, this is in the 10K. Um, they don't usually give as detailed of a breakdown in the 10Q, usually just what's really driving uh, the results. They discuss their business strategy, um, their competition, who they think their competition is. Um, Basically, they talk about the various assets that they have. Now, in terms of the actual financial data, let's see. Yeah, and um, some of those things are important. Like the risk factor is something that I use just to gauge a company, especially if I don't know the industry, if I don't know the stock particularly. Competition, it's definitely one of the other key factors that um, I look into because I'm trying to build a model and do a comparative analysis then I need to know what they're competing against so that I can use that towards uh, its peer set. So definitely two things that are so important. Right. And uh, as you can see here, we have the balance sheets. And um, as you can see, it looks pretty different from what we actually had. Um, it's actually not too different. Um, I think Amazon will have a little bit more different one. Uh, they really <laughs> have a pretty bare bones one. But as you can see, they just give you the last two years so you can compare them. Um, and let's see. Um, right. So, and then and afterwards, right? here are the notes, right, that accompany this, right? So they actually don't have any, like, usually there will be a, like, a, a number, right? And it'll be like, oh, like, look here, and we're going to explain this item to you. But they basically just explain um, all the items, how they define them, right? Like inventory, right? Their definition for it. Um, and it helps know that, right? Here's 
Uh, they provide you with a guide in terms of how they value the assets on the balance sheet. Um, right. So this is, this is always good to read through um, because you actually know like what you're looking at and they also try and explain um, notable things, right? Like, Oh, like we issue debt, um, right. The, in the form of convertible senior notes, they like mature 2025, 2022, right? Here's the, what the revenue recognition that I was talking about, right? So revenue is recognized at the time products are delivered. One collection is considered probable, right? So actually one thing you guys might have read on the news during the, when the pandemic just hit, right? Is banks having provisions for credit losses, right? So that's when they deem like loans uncollectible, right? So they assume that they're not gonna get any revenue from those loans. So they have to write those off, right? And so in that case, they have to take a loss because they actually um, basically, I, I think this is how it works, right? They, they recognize the revenue for it, but in reality, they're not actually gonna be able to um, collect on it and that's actually going to be adjusted on the balance sheet as well i, I believe all right um tj am i missing anything on the 10k we're talking about here no i think he covered everything um all you right. know companies will sometimes report two things they'll report the gap um accounting principles right because they have to and then they'll provide a non-gap so again just like mark explained they are trying to sell their business. This page is called investors Rela investor relations, right? So the reason why they're going to give you non-GAAP is because they probably have a different metric or a different way of analyzing or viewing their you know, balance sheets. Now, one thing is with a, a company that you can trust, something like Amazon, there's not going to be a lot of distrust in a company like that. A company that's a penny stock those are ones that you can't really take their word for it. Like they, if they are, if there's a huge discrepancy between gap and non-gap, then there is definitely something that could be fishy. Like right. Uh, LK, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we, you also recently talked about this, right? That, a lot of people are like on the hunt for fraud. Um, personally, like I don't think it's a necessary use of your energy, right? Just because it's so uncommon. It's there's really rare cases for it, right? But this is why we do have the SEC and we have regulatory bodies overseeing this, right? To incentivize companies to not um commit fraud, right? And additionally, you have that element of competition right so every company is trying to present themselves in the best light every company wants to look good so um you know why not if everyone every company is doing that then why should we uh right like i guess discount the word of one company versus another right yeah and that's what the sec is there for right it's there to protect investors like ourselves are there companies that commit fraud can their numbers be you know, exaggerate. Um, what's the word? Exaggerated. Exaggerated. There we go. Uh, yes, it could happen, but that's why we always look at the book. We want to see the story. If we see like um, a pattern of revenue growth, I mean, that makes sense. If we see a company is growing at 12% and then all out of nowhere, the company without even explaining why they just had like a 50% revenue increase quarter to quarter, and it just continues, you know, there's probably something fishy on that, right? Right, right. Right. Um, so as previously stated, um, in the um, in the filings, right, companies are going to present you a limited amount of information. I honestly don't know why they can't just present it very neatly for us. Um, but other websites have gone on to do that for you. So this is a free website right here, Rocket Financial. And here, they basically just compile for you um, the financial statements. 
of any company. Do I have to send in here? Yes, I do. All right. Uh, Bamsec. All right. Well, it's fine. But I encourage you guys to check this out. Um, all it really does is you're able to just export all of their uh, financials into a spreadsheet. So check that out. Next, um, going back to what we were talking about, the actual analysis, right? So the first method we're going to talk about is horizontal analysis. And it's one of the most effective ones because what we're looking at is a time series, right, for each line of the financial statements. And we're looking to see how that's changing, whether anything notable is happening. And this is really where you see the story start to come out. And my favorite website for this is Macro Trends, another free website that I don't have to log into. Um, and they have all these charts here. So this is, I like screening companies like this because I can really quickly just see um, what's been happening here now. We're going to take a look at both Amazon and uh, G Pro right here. And you're going to see the difference, right? Between a company that has competitive advantage and does not, right? Or has a limited competitive advantage. I would say GoPro does have a competitive advantage in the action camera market, but uh, right. They don't dominate like just like Amazon. So right here we see they they have really inconsistent uh, revenue growth right they have periods of downturn this is 2016 the period we were talking about earlier when they had a restructuring they were they almost came out of it but then their business still continued to um, slow this is during the pandemic where they experienced right strong declines in revenue um, growth um, and this is what really made us excited because we saw a really strong recovery um, in the most recent quarter is a little bit muted, but overall, right. Uh, I think another trend that you're able to see here is the cyclicality, right? So every fourth quarter, uh, which is usually the holiday season, the revenues go up. So um, you can keep that in mind. Like, Oh, I'm, I'm investing during an extremely important quarter, right? Like this result is, um, it's going to probably, let's see, it's going to, yeah, it basically generates half of the rev annual revenue for the company, right? So you, you, you begin to start knowing what to look for. Now, I'll just look at Amazon real quick, and you guys are going to see the difference here. So this is what competitive advantage looks like, right? This is just consistent growth, right? It does fluctuate a little bit, um, but this is the consistency right that we're looking for right this is a company that for more than a decade and a half i would say this probably goes back even further but um that continuously grew their business right and that's a difference between something like amazon and right something like gopro right so you might have this one odd quarter with 114% revenue growth, right? Or even this like streak where you're like, oh wow, they're growing at 20% a year, right? Um, that means like their revenue should like double, um, right? In like three or four years, right? Um, but then that's actually not the case. And for Amazon it is, right? And you can count on that growth to be consistent, right? And that's really what we are looking for. Now let's look at some other things and this is why i love this website so next thing i like looking at is is the margins right now this this really tells us the story right so initially gopro um their gross margins were growing right they were discovering economies of scale right ways to produce their products for cheaper but then uh right they they stop they you see the erosion right of that competitive advantage you have other companies entering the market the profits are competed away, basically, right? They must uh, invest more money, right? Uh, so they have higher marketing costs, right? Associated with, you know, it takes more effort to sell the same amount of product. Um, they don't have the same kinds of scale. And ultimately that turns into declining net income. And they basically are a money losing company for many years. 
And then we have 2016, where they begin their restructuring, they experiment with different products. They realize those products actually do not, some of them do not work. They cut those products out. They uh, continue to restructure and they're finally on the brink of profitability for the last uh, two or three, um, basically the last two years. And so this is another part that we were excited about, right? So the, the highest rewards, right, come from companies that are on the brink of profitability, right? Companies that are just about to turn a profit. And once that profit is realized, right? So I know TJ likes to talk about Tesla, right? When Elon Musk said, we're going to be profitable quarter over quarter, that was the key turning point for him um right that's when actually your shares start to really be worth something right because up to that point um there's no earnings right for your shares right so what the value of the share is is on it's just a bet right on what the shares might be worth in the future right um so we can actually look at tesla i haven't looked at it It'll be interesting to see what happened with their margins, right? So for the longest time, they were really struggling with profitability, right? Um, and eventually, right, they were able to unlock that profitability. And that's really when everything changed, right? And if you actually look at the stock price, right, that's when its meteoric ascent started, right? Um, so you can actually see that example right here now. Let's look at Amazon. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to do the fundamental analysis. I mean, you know, everyone uses Tesla as like a benchmark when they're looking at other EV stocks, but what they don't realize is it took them years to hit this point where they're profitable. And when they did get there, that's when you got that explosive move on Tesla. Tesla went up almost a thousand percent after actually probably a little bit over a thousand percent after they came out with that news saying, Hey, we're going to be cash flow positive going forward with a few exceptions, one or two quarters here and there. That is why we do fundamental analysis because it gives us insight into a stock that at a time when people are just trading it, they're like, oh, I made you know $50 on this. I'm happy with it. I'm gonna just close my position. Well, with fundamentals, you don't have to. You're like, okay, I believe in this company. Company just said that they're gonna be profitable. Let's hold on. Right. and. Right, that, that gives you the conviction, right, that you need to invest in a company because you're like, this is the story, right? I believe that this company is on the brink, right, of, uh, I guess, turning it around and uh, establishing itself as, you know, the company that I expect it to be, right, which is the company that dominates the automotive industry, right? And here we are starting to see the numbers back that up, right? And you're starting to see that proof of concept. And let's go now. Let's go to Amazon. Right now, this is the story of a company that absolutely took over, right, and dominated its market. Look at their gross margin, the economies of scale that they realized over the last decade. It's just continuous improvement, right? There's, there's just no, there's pretty much no dips. Um, I think what we see here, actually, we saw their gross margin get um, pressured a little bit. I assume just because of like all the volume that they had to deal with uh, in recent times. Um, I also assume that this, for this here, um, AWS is largely responsible for this. Um, because that really does drive the most of their profitability. Um, and I, I, I think as an Amazon investor at this point, I would be concerned about this, just like their increasing margin pressure. Now, historically, Amazon wasn't a company that prioritized profitability. Um, I actually remember like I was reading about Amazon and they were talking about how like when AWS was first presented, Jeff Bezos was told that, like it would take like five years to actually turn a profit. And he was like, great. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, for a company like Amazon, right, they're able to turn it around here. And 
again, like you can see this shift starting to happen, right? And that's a, one of the coolest parts, right? Of just like visualizing this is because you can actually pretty much do like technical analysis on fundamentals, right? Which for me is one of the coolest things there is. And you get to time really good entries because, um, you know, Amazon is a good example. If you take a look in, you know, how it was trading back then to now, it's when it became profitable, when AWS started working, that you saw that the Amazon, like the stock price just skyrocketed. A lot of people think there's just technicals because there's people that like the stock that see it and they're like, oh yeah, this, um, this is a good business model. No, there's actually fundamentals that drive their decision-making. Amazon was trading at around $300 and it was stagnant there when it was in 2014, I think, 2013 or 2014, what Mark yeah. was showing. Oh, there it is, right? And it just moved up because we saw that the margins have improved. They are going in the right direction and that's what caused it to go up this high. That little change, you know, from 4% margins to, to 1% margin and then slightly moving right back up. There you go. That exactly, like look at the operating margins, right? That was the scary part. But we already knew what was going to happen in the future. They were going with AWS, a better business model because they get way better margins on it. That's when you saw the whole growth spike on Amazon. Right. And uh, that is one of the advantages, right, of a company that dominates, right? Because what they're able to do is they're able to go into a market, they're able to capture the majority of the market share in that market, and then they're able to expand into other markets, right? So while their current market might become less profitable, right, they're able to tap into other markets, right, that are also like growing quickly, right? And that's going to be really the lifeline for their business. So that's one of the reasons why we like companies like this, companies that aren't one dimensional, right? And I guess are pure plays because, uh, right, they can diversify their expectations, right? Um, so that is definitely something we look for. Now, lastly, another thing I like to look at is Let's pull up GoPro. All right, so let's see. We were previously talking about their stockholders equity. So let's see if they have that. Um, oh yeah, here we go. All right, so they didn't go negative, but you guys can see that as they, hmm, is it, they have a slide here. Where they have, not sure, but they, they have a chart here, right? Where they show you the net income and they show you the shareholders equity, right? And what was it again? Um, and so you can see, right, that once their net income starts taking a hit, where does that loss go? It goes into the back, the book value of the equity, right? So as they take more and more losses, that continues to erode the book value of their equity. Um, and you might wonder what happens when the book value of equity of a company goes negative. Actually, they don't go bankrupt. Interestingly enough, I actually saw Avi had a negative um, book value of equity. Um, you know, the because what matters, right, is the market value, which is what the investors determine for it right so maybe this went negative but investors are like nah like in the future they're going to recover they're going to have retained earnings right and uh the book value is going to recover now we're gonna as we progress towards pretty much the end we're going to be looking at a bunch of ratios that are a way to determine um, I guess the liquidity of a company and we previously talked about the current ratio. Now here they had a current ratio of 3.91. This also coincided with like one of their worst performing periods, right? 
So, and you actually see that as they try to reinvest in their business and redefine it and re restructure it, that went down. And even though that went down, that's not a bad thing, right? Because they were just deploying, um, you know, liquid assets that they didn't really uh, need to just be holding in place to be covering their short-term obligations. So it's completely fine they did that. Um, for value picks, right, we want to see this going from the low one to above one um, or in the process, right? Um, because that implies, right, that their financial condition is improving. We also have the debt to equity ratio, um, right? So this gives us an idea of their capital structure, right? Um, what percentage of it is debt, what percentage of it is equity. You'll see that in software, especially this number is almost always zero because there's not a lot of overhead. There's not a lot of costs, right? And so companies are usually don't have to rely on debt financing. Now, debt financing is cheaper because than equity financing, right? Because it is um, tax deductible as we previously talked about. But um, here you can see the uh, GoPro took out some debt in uh, 2017. And uh, they actually did another round as we saw in the 10K. And uh, it's all visible right here. So that's pretty much it for so here we see actually, this is what I was looking for, right? As the net income um, declines and turns negative, the shareholders equity, um, right? That eats into it and you see a low return on equity. Um, and one of the things about looking at all these ratios is it gives you things to screen with, right? So I like to keep, right? Uh, larger themes in mind and, uh, when I'm looking at companies, but I prefer just doing a bottom-up approach, right? Which is you start with the fundamentals, you see which companies have strong fundamentals, and then you go from there, right? You could also see, I guess, which companies have improving fundamentals and et cetera. So this is a website that helps us do that. And let's just lastly look at Amazon, see what happened, right? So now you see, right? The book value of equity just, continuously increasing year over year. Um, and that's exactly what you want as um, an equity holder. Current ratio. All right, the Amazon has basically kept it just above one, right? And first of all, the fact that this doesn't fluctuate just shows you that like Amazon really is in control of their balance sheet, right? Um, they they don't need to like I guess borrow from the future and uh, over rely on the like you know liabilities right and they're able to always cover their um, and again as we previously talked right um, when those operating margins dipped in uh, back in 2014 right that was the scary part so you saw that current ratio drop at 0.89. So finally, to uh, wrap up our lesson, let's uh, open up Excel here. And one more thing I wanted to add to that. So you see how Amazon was back in 2006 to 2010, how you know the current ratio was just choppy. You're going to see that with a lot of companies, guys. Something like Amazon, you can see, hey, they got their shit together after 2014. That's when they started to really know their business was able to accurately predict what they needed and they were able to like maintain it most companies are going to look like 2006 to 2012 ish okay makes sense all right so we have the um g pro um statements exported here but uh you can actually go to that website rocket financial rocket um, and uh, get this as well. I think it's a pretty good exercise to actually go through these um, and try and see if you can calculate some of these on your own because you'll just see uh, right what constitute these ratios. So when you see them online or elsewhere, I guess, um, you're actually gonna be able to know um, what's happening. But 
Um, in addition to horizontal analysis, right, we also have vertical analysis. Now, what you're doing here is you're taking each line item as a percentage of either net sales or gross profit, right, overarching line items, I would say, in order to see, um, right, how a particular item is like fitting into, I guess, a specific section just being brought here. So if we're looking at like operating expenses, right, we, we want to know, okay, like what percentage of their gross profit goes away towards marketing, right? Which, what percentage goes towards um, their general administrative, right? What percentage goes to um, R&D? And why do we want to know that percentage is because just looking at this, we, we really don't like see that drastic of a change happening here, right? Um, and so looking at it this way, we're able to see if things have changed, right? Um, so let me just direct your attention right here. So for the example I just described, right? If we're looking at the percentage of gross profit that goes towards selling expenses, right? As I previously said, for a company with competitive advantage, you want to see this number staying consistent because if their sales go down, it means that they're able to adjust for that and lower their costs, right? Um, this is not the case with GoPro, um, right? They took a loss here because their selling expenses really stayed the same um, relative to the gross profit they were pretty much equal relative to the gross profit they generated, right? So immediately there's no margin here, right? And uh, again, you can see that even though their revenue went down, they, their selling and marketing expense, it didn't adjust the same way, right? Um, administrative expensive, that's something that a company can usually control a lot more, right? Um, because that's just like administrative costs, right? So a lot of times there is a lot of wiggle room there. So usually those can be low. Um, you, you still see it uh, spiking up here. And R&D, uh, same thing. Basically, I, I would say, right, like this is a huge reason as to why they weren't able to weather the storm, right? When their business saw a downturn, because they really didn't have that financial flexibility right and uh same thing here for example we said we want to see gross margin staying consistent right this is the gross margin right here and this got eroded right so initially gopro i would say probably was the first to the action camera market i'm not familiar with the history of it but right they went to this market they had broad economies of scale competitors went in became more expensive or i guess maybe suppliers um had more offers on the table right they increased their prices they had more negotiating power uh, maybe they had to compete in terms of pricing right um in order to acquire new customers right maybe now gopro shines to recover so uh, they're really you know not uh like they're not charging as much for their products right they're um, and their, their volumes are lower, right? So their expenses are higher. Um, again, this is, this is pretty much the trend that we saw in macro trends, right? You don't even have to calculate this effective tax rate. Effective tax rate is basically, right? Uh, we all know like the corporate tax rate is 21%. That's not what companies usually pay. They'll usually pay considerably less, considerably more of that based on deferred taxes, right? Um, accrued taxes, um, tax benefits, things like that. So um, as a result, uh, and again, this is useful in valuation, right? Because um, we apply that to the EBIT when we calculate free cash flow, but that's for, that's another lesson. Um, now we have some ratios here. Um, so these are not your traditional leverage ratios. These are rather how efficiently a company is able to utilize um, the assets, uh, not, not the assets. It's basically 
how much um i guess income they can generate for every like increase in sales right so here um gopro sales increased in 2012 but uh but you know they weren't able to generate more net income right here they were <laughs> but what we do see here is very wild fluctuations here right which again in this case we want to see consistency um similarly we have operating leverage um right that's how much operating profit you're able to generate for the increase increase how much increases in profit you're able to uh, get for increase in sales um financial leverage right how much net income you're able to get out of your operating profit now um we also have the margins that we talked about all right now Finally, we have the solvency ratios, right? Which are pretty much telling us how easily companies can meet their financial um, obligations, right? We talked about the current ratio, the quick ratio, right? What we're doing here is uh, we're basically seeing um, cash and uh, accounts receivable, which are pretty liquid parts of the current assets um, out of their total current liabilities, right? To see, these are the um, current assets that they're most easily able to deploy, right? And we wanna see how well they cover that. Um, the cash ratio, I believe this, all right, I don't think this is calculated correctly, but um, this should be cash to current liabilities, right? So if you had to meet your current liabilities uh, with cash only, would you be able to do that? What per, if not, what percentage of those liabilities would you be able to meet? Finally, um, approaching the end here, um, we have, so days inventory. So what this is, is it basically looks at, um, well, first of all, it takes turnover ratios into account. So this basically tells us how many times in a year um, right, a company can cycle through its receivables, its inventory, and its accounts payable, right? So, um, right. So on receivables, a company has to, um, right, basically, so both of these, they're not immediately realized, right? A company has to either collect on them or, uh, you know, pay them at a future point in time. So we want to see how quickly they're able to go through those, their inventory, right? Um, how quickly they're able to turn through that. Um, and then with uh, this portion right here, all we're doing is we're taking these ratios and we're seeing how they pan out over the course of a year. And ultimately, um, I'm rushing a little here just to uh, get to the end here, but that sums out to the cash collection cycle. And what that briefly means is that it tell, gives you an idea of how many days it takes for right cash to circulate through the company's operations, right? The shorter, the better. So for uh, more established companies, you'll see this number being significantly smaller because they have to make less accommodations to uh, buyers. They can uh, negotiate with suppliers, right? More effectively. And they're probably also able to like go through their inventory both quicker and have less of it on hand um, at the same time. Um, finally, we we already talked about debt to equity. Um, another way of measuring whether a company is able to meet its financial obligations is debt to EBITDA, right? So that's so we talked about EBIT being operating income, adding back depreciation and amortization. We want to see um, right whether we can cover uh, like debt debt how many how many cycles right of generating uh, EBITDA will it take for us to uh, pay off our debt? Um, I think that covers the majority of them. We're gonna make this available for you guys um, in the future, uh, and you'll be able to go through this, see how things are calculated. Um, also, you'll see how Bloomberg calculated a few of these, um, but I think that 
largely captures the majority of it. Um, I think with that, um, if TJ, if you have anything to add, feel free. Um, for those of uh, for those of you that stuck with us, we appreciate it, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, take your questions. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'll let you take a little break, Mark. Um, now, one of the biggest things that you're going to see on a balance sheet is inconsistency. So when we're predicting or modeling anything, something like Gro GoPro is a lot harder to model. As you can see, it's a, they didn't have like a, you know, linear revenue, um, you know, court on a quarterly basis, right? Something like GoPro, uh, sorry, something like Amazon, it's so easy. I mean, look at that, that's linear. For us to model something like Amazon, it's much easier. And that's why we say that these are risk-free companies. If you take a look at, um, Mark, let's choose uh, Microsoft, for example. You see, it's much easier to mo model these companies because it's so linear. Now, if you go back to something like GoPro, you'll notice that it's not that easy. That's why you'll see wild fluctuations on their stock or, you know, a company that isn't really, you know, performing well or growing, right? When we say that there's risk, is there's, there's risk when we're modeling because it's kind of hard to model certain companies. Something like Amazon is much easier, right? Um, something like this, much harder. There's just, there's just so much quarterly revenue, you know, growth and decline. So it makes it much harder. If you take a look at that bottom uh, section like that chart, look at the green and red bars. That is so hard to model, which is why they're priced at such a cheap price. You know, it's not just about revenue growth, right? We can be like, oh, you know, Amazon hit 70% revenue growth. So GoPro's doing it. It should go by, it should go up this much, just like Amazon did. It's not that simple. And it's not that consistent, right? And you'll see this when you are doing you know, financial models. When you're looking through the balance sheet, for any financial statement, this isn't something that you're going to pick up right off the bat. You're not going to pick it up the moment you see it. You can look at 50 different financial statements and still not understand the nuances of each. But it's that 51 or the 52nd one that will actually start to sink in and you'll kind of see the metrics. Now, when we're modeling, because we had this question here, which was, you know, uh, someone mentioned that this is speculating. This is not speculating. Something like this, yes, there's some speculation. Something like Amazon, no, it's linear. Something like Microsoft, no. Something like GME, oh yeah, definitely speculation, right? And we want you guys to understand what is a good balance sheet, what is a, you know, okay balance sheet. GoPro is still a good company. They're a great value stock but so is Amazon. But you'll see us putting way more emphasis on Amazon or size into something like Amazon because we have less risk because we can model it. Now, the difference I think with speculating and what we're doing, which is coming up with assumptions, which, you know, it's, it's pretty much everything it's that we do, right? We have to come up with assumptions on what they're going to do in the future. Everyone can say, yeah, we don't know the future. Yeah, but we can look at the past and get a general idea of what, what they're doing. We can even make it simple. You guys can actually do simple assumptions. If you take, let's say GoPro, for example, you add every one of their quarterly revenue increases or decreases, right? You can easily add a moving average to it, or you can easily just look at the mean on it. There's so many different ways that you could kind of predict what like a company is going to do but it's never going to be easy like GoPro. On a quarterly basis, it's going to be hard to model. On a yearly basis, a little bit easier. Um, now, by extension of that, if we look at an IPO, right? This is the data that we have available. So maybe if you look at a company's S1, right, which is the filing that IPOs usually release, um, you'll be able to see data going three years back, right? But this is all the information that we have, right? And 
I know you guys, for example, trade IPOs right now. How do you trade an IPO, right? You go really light. You try and take very little risk. You basically don't have any indicators, right? All you have is just the immediate price and the volume, right? So your conviction is usually probably pretty low, right? And this is the same way. If you don't have the historic data, right? There's nothing to base your conviction off of, right? So I hope that makes it more understandable why we say that you should build your account around something like this rather than right something that has literally no past data. Now, it may be a great investment and I might appreciate a lot quickly, a lot more quickly, right? But it's undeniable that your conviction will be lower, which means that you'll hold on for, for a shorter period of time. And uh, right, ultimately, you have smaller risk adjusted return. Yeah, and GoPro is a good example of this, actually. Uh, Mark, do you mind putting the GoPro um, price chart up? Because yeah. you'll see it. This is an IPO. When, when it IPO'd, everybody loved it. I remember I was trading it too. Um, and, you know, look at the stock price. It went up. Everyone was happy. They did amazing. Their revenue growth was high, obviously, because now they just had an IPO. They had more cash flow than they've ever had in their lifetime. So they could easily, you know, expand their marketing operations, right? And that's what they did. You know, they spend a lot of money on marketing and obviously brought the revenue growth up after a certain point. You know, there's only so much you can do, right? Now, when you look at a stock like this, this is why like IPOs are so risky because you don't have enough information. So in that beginning stage, that's speculative. That stock until 2017-ish was still, I'd still consider it a speculative buy because we didn't have enough data. On something like Amazon, totally different. We have enough data to back our analysis on. And again, that's, I think the, dif the difference between like speculating and then there's also, you know, assumptions. When we come up with assumptions, it's usually based on something. Either we can base it on the company itself or we can base it on its peers. If we saw that, you know, the re same reason why I bought W and uh, why like W is Wayfair. The reason I bought Wayfair is by looking at Amazon. And I'm like, oh my God, Amazon did really good during uh, COVID. Wayfair should be next, right? You can compare their growth with their peers and try to find a peer set that's you know, like, again, not all business models are going to be the same, but try and find one that's kind of similar. And you can apply what you've learned on that one stock on the other stock. That's why we listen to these earnings calls. The reason why I got GME at $4 was because they said something in their earnings call, like, hey, we're paying off our debt. Um, and Mark, if you don't mind, do you mind checking GME actually? Yeah, Check it out. What do you want to look at? Um, their debt. I'm thinking. Look at their liabilities. Pretty sure they it changed by. I say. Um, okay, I think it's. Hmm. Ah, I forgot where it was now. But there was a part where, actually, let me see if I can find. You're on GameStop, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so take a look at their current liabilities, if we can. There was a substantial increase from 2019 to 2020. Um, there was a, well, 2019, they had. $2.1 billion, I believe. Because that shows you quarterly, right? Right. Yeah, okay. And you can actually see it actually on the chart. You see how it kind of dec decreased? From 2019, they were at $2.1 billion. In 2020, um, February, they went down to $1.2 billion. And then there's the debt. They were, they had like a huge amount of debt, uh, but again, they said that they were paying it off. That's what provided us the ability to, you know, buy this stock 
and for the stock to be a good value. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, and that one's a little bit harder because you can only see the quarterly basis, I guess. Um, on a yearly basis, it's a little bit more clear. You'll actually see, I mean, it's a huge decrease. And here's their margins, right? So yeah, this is right the story again of a company that has their shit figured out. <laughs> and um, until that. they didn't. <laughs> until they didn't, right? So and you can probably spot that, right? When when you for example right, like you can just look at this as like a support and resistance right like when this level broke that they held for so long something critical happened right um it's their business model right? yeah and there was a shift in uh, consumer sentiment right instead of going to stores now people are buying games online um you know especially from 2018 most of those like the P playstation everything like you can buy the game just by like not leaving your house right so that kind of destroyed their uh, business model a bit and then the company had to readjust now if you take a look at when we bought um, gopro that was last year 2018 right 2018 around june july or june is when we bought um sorry game game sorry gamestop my apologies gotcha. <laughs> you switched it my bad i have to like remove <laughs> the the last like month yeah so when we bought it it was around there right it was trading around four dollars when i bought it and if you take a look at its um their margins actually now take a look at the margins there so this is what we were predicting. We were predicting that, hey, they have hit a like rock bottom. It can't get any worse than this. There's only upside to it. And that's what made us get it. So yes, is there a little bit of speculation? Yes. But again, you know, we're trying to make assumptions based on their business model. I couldn't have seen it going any worse than what it had gone through in 2000. Well, and during the... Um, pandemic i mean that's the worst case scenario for any company if you're a retail store and all the malls are closed well guess what that's the worst scenario ever right so then i was like okay there's only upside from here and that's why you know we went long at four bucks and as you can see it slowly improved right. and um one last thing that so we basically talked about a lot of these and you guys, we, I think we might have some recommended readings, but there's a lot of things that you can look for, right? Like, I think we talked about this, a lot of these actually throughout the lesson, but um, just, you, you just try and think of the numbers, right? More than just data, right? Like it, it tells you a story and, we hope that you might be able to start to do now is read that story through the numbers. And uh, with that, yeah. I guess we can take and, some questions. Yeah. And uh, one more thing I wanted to add to that too. So before I look at a company, the first thing I look at is this. You have to look at the financial statements. Before you can paint a picture of what the stock is doing, you need to paint a picture of how, how the company is doing. I find that way to be a lot more effective because then I already have a picture. I know what the company is doing. I know how they're doing. I know if their balance sheet is clean. I know if there's any red flags. And then I look at the stock and I look at the actual, you know, stock price. And when I, when I look at the chart, I want to see that it matches the fundamentals because you can only use fundamentals on stuff that really match, um, like, you know, trade well fundamentally, right? it's much easier to go for stocks that trade better, like fundamentally because of that one reason, because A, you can see what the company has been doing. You can see when they had a bad quarter, how the company reacted. Penny stocks are totally different. We don't get those aggressive reactions with penny stocks. So that's why we kind of use fundamentals for the larger tech companies or larger companies overall, because they have more data. The more data we have, the more accurate our modeling is going to be. And 
with penny stocks, it's so inconsistent that it's so hard to model that we don't even bother wasting our time with it. All right, and uh, we'll open this up to the floor. Let's see. If you guys have any questions, just uh, post it right now. Oh, I got a question. Someone had a question. How do we listen to earnings calls? That's simple. Just Google the ticker. So let's say it's Amazon. You just type in Amazon IR and it'll take you to there. Actually, let's choose a different one. Let's choose uh, Microsoft. So just type in Microsoft IR. That's it. You can just type the ticker name and you'll see it. One of the first links. And then if you want to listen to their webcasts, they should have one. There it is. And they have their past one, past um, events too. So if you ever want to listen to that, you have it all there. And uh, usually, I guess some of the more developed companies will provide a transcript. Um, I just like searching like Microsoft earnings transcript and Molly Fool will usually have it. This is my preferred way of looking at it. Honestly, I'm a little worse <laughs> listening to it. Um, it's the more efficient way to just listen to it. And usually you'll probably have like a delay of one day before it gets typed up. But this is really one of the things we weren't able to cover in this lesson. But um, I think this is one of the most important aspects of analyzing a company, right? Because not only are you able to like listen to a company's executives talk and just like gauge their confidence, gauge their outlook, see like you, you start to pay attention, right? To the language that they use with regards to some specific things, right? And as of course, right, we said like they want to present their companies in the best way possible, but one thing they can do is lie, right? And so sometimes, right, they, the way that they'll talk about it will tell you, right, um, what really is going on. And as an extension of that, you're going to be able to see what, I guess, like professional analysts, right, are what's the most important thing to them and why are they asking these questions? And that's because they are updating their models, right? So for for right every analyst gets maybe one two may if they're really like ballsy they can get three questions but right they only get to choose one question uh and they're able to ask a question right four times a year right so they're going to choose the most important input that is not in the data right that the company doesn't reveal um that is gonna like fill the picture for their model, right? And you're gonna see what's the most important things, right? And this is gonna tell you what to watch out for, right? Um, because these are ultimately gonna be the things that impact the stock price probably the most, right? Um, because this is where there is the most amount of uncertainty regarding the company, right? So- um, Oh, if you actually it, scroll up too, sorry to cut you off, Mark. A little bit more there, right there, a bit lower. All right, so you see um, where it says the CEO was talking the last paragraph over there, but more importantly for me, Mark, no, oh, that's funny, his name's Mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they're looking at the next 10 years. So, you know, when you ask a question, it's like, okay, what are they positioning themselves for? What is the company trying to do? you can see that, hey, they have a 10-year goal. So maybe this is a company that has a ton of CapEx, but it's because they're looking in the future. How far in the future? They just pretty much just summed it up for you. So if you're going to be doing any sort of DCF model, you know, and the company's trying to position themselves for the next 10 years, and you're running a five-year DCF model, are you going to be getting the full value of what the company is projecting? Or what they're planning to, uh, for. No, right? So there's a lot of information that you're going to actually, you know, get. And there's some questions that are asked that I didn't even, even consider at some point. That's why we listen to the earnings call. And I honestly like uh, reading over the analyst questions and comments. This is vital information because most of these analysts, 
even though we're, they're working at different firms, the larger firms have single stock, like single equity analysts, right? So their job is to know one stock, a, a bit about it, its peers, and that's about it. Then there's uh, analysts that are in charge of a subsector or a sector overall or an industry, you know, so they have all the data that we don't have access to. So when they're asking these questions, it's because no matter how much money these guys are managing, no matter how much money they had at their disposal, they still need to know the answer to this question. And that's something that they couldn't have acquired using their vast resources. That is a competitive advantage for us. Yeah, I mean, I think that really sums it all up, right? Like, it's such an advantage for us to be able to just like have access to all of this info. And all we're doing here is just analyzing it to at a higher level, right? Than the rest of the market who I would say, right? The majority of people won't even look at this stuff, right? So here's something that's extremely valuable that could increase your conviction in a company, right? That could give you an idea of what the company like might be valued at where what direction it's being headed in and most people don't even acknowledge this resource right so just by reading this you're getting advantage exactly and we have another question too now guys how do we evaluate ipos we're going to save that for another lesson because we we're going to talk about you know comparative analysis for that lesson, I think IPOs will fit um, perfectly within it because, um, again, we don't have the data, but we do have a peer set and we can base our decisions based on that peer group, right? Now, that's going to be on a different lesson. And as far as, um, actually, there's one more question, S Y. So when Amazon jumped from 1400 to 3000, the fundamentals didn't change right away. So is the jump based on estimated future growth due to store closing and estimated demand in e-commerce? It's a combination, to be honest. Um, but if you actually take a look, Amazon, so when was it trading at 3,000? Give me one second, I'll pull it up. Amazon 1400, so that was around March, February, 2018 to 2019, it was around that area, yeah. Look at 2018, um, Mark, go back to around March, 2018-ish. Oh, um, same thing on the same like uh, margins. There you go. You do see growth. Gross margins are growing. Operating margins, net margins, all of them are growing. Yeah, I mean, right, this growth right here happened just because so much volume came in that they were right, able to start like exploiting those operating efficiencies, right? And AWS had, right, also really fast growth which is also responsible for the bulk of their profitability i think the international segment at amazon had like their first profitable quarter i think right yeah so yeah all right i think that is everything uh for us right now and if you guys do have any more questions, please uh, just jot it down in our Discord group. We'll try to get to them, um, or we can actually add use those questions to you know do a separate lesson on them. Mark, I just want to thank you so much. You've been talking nonstop for two and a half hours, so appreciate all the hard work. And guys, please make sure that you DM Mike, uh, sorry Mark, <laughs> on a daily basis, thanking okay. him for all the hard work because this <laughs> took literally like month in preparation to get you guys uh, this quality lesson. And guys, the value that you get from this type of, you know, lesson, honestly, you won't find it elsewhere. Most lessons will just tell you exactly what you can Google. 
we're giving you and sharing our insights on how we conduct our analysis, which is priceless. So thanks for uh, joining us, guys, and enjoy the rest of your days. Have a good one, guys.